Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 7 of my ongoing XCOM 2 challenge run series here on YouTube. Today we're asking the question, can you beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only Grenadiers? Now Grenadiers are super powerful, so the obvious answer to that question is yes, right? Well, sometimes things aren't as straightforward as we expect them to be. Now, Grenadiers are your heavy class in this game. One branch of their skill tree focuses more or less on grenades, which is to be expected given the name. And grenades are obviously awesome, as not only can they damage multiple enemies at once, they can destroy cover, making it easier to shoot at any enemies who survive. Also, grenades from the grenade launcher have a bigger area of effect than the usual explosives we're used to using that we just throw from our hands. The other branch of the skill tree has more focus on the cannon that these guys carry. Yes, you heard me right. In addition to their grenade launcher, they carry a cannon. This thing does good damage, it can shred, and it only takes one action point to fire, unlike the sniper rifle. It is a beast of a weapon. To counteract this, Grenadiers don't have an amazing aim stat, but as the game progresses, we'll find plenty of ways to buff their naturally low aim. The other thing Grenadiers have going for them that may be overlooked is that they can carry an extra utility item over the other classes. Now there are some slight weaknesses the Grenadiers might have. Firstly is that along with snipers, I believe they're the slowest to level up of the base classes. It's also worth noting that they can't make use of any of the chosen weapons, and we've seen how useful those items can be. But neither of those are a major problem by any means. So with all these things in mind, yeah, Grenadiers are pretty awesome. I'm expecting this one to go quite smoothly. <laughs> As usual, I do live stream these runs in full on my Twitch channel. Give me a follow over there if that interests you. The link is in the description. And if you enjoy this video, please like, comment and subscribe. It helps me out. As for the rules, they're the same as usual. We're playing on Commander difficulty. We're playing with Honest Man rules, which means we can only reload in the event of misclicks or glitches. And the big one, only Grenadiers are allowed in combat. I used the Starting Soldiers mod to replace our regular starting barracks with 12 Grenadiers. We set up on this building, and the distance we can launch a grenade is simply staggering. These Advent Soldiers are a long way away, but not quite long enough. So we use one nade to say hello, and then waste the pod with Overwatch. With the second pod, I hunker down with Failed while hanging back with the rest of the squad. My hope is to lure the enemies into an Overwatch trap, and that's exactly what happens, seeing us take down two of them. And just like the Ranger's shotguns, our cannon will roll 4-6 to six damage, so Advent Troops are a guaranteed one-shot, provided we don't miss. You've got to love that. Multiple grenades then finish off the Captain, and this one's done. Now that one was easy, but it was my second attempt. In the first one, the pods were on top of each other, so got activated at the same time. Our Grenadiers took a casualty, so I restarted, so it hasn't been entirely smooth sailing. As usual, I build a flashbang first, but I also build a medikit, which I normally skip with these base classes. Maybe I'm getting sentimental in my old age, who knows. Then we hit the resistance ring as per usual. Now we get a research breakthrough here already, giving us interchangeable weapon mods, meaning they won't get destroyed if we replace them on a weapon. I'm always really indecisive with my weapon mods, so I do like getting this one. So the first Gorilla Op, we hit the roof of this church. I remember the first time I played on one of these church maps, I felt really bad blowing the place up. But then I realised it was a church to worship the aliens, and I raised that place to the ground. So the first pot I ambush with a grenade, but after scattering, they're actually close enough to hit both with a grenade again. So that's what we do. The trooper is gone, but the sectoid has survived. It has more HP. And regular viewers will know I like to complain about line of sight in this game. 
Well, this may be the best complaint yet. So you can see where I am, and I've marked the tile the sectoid is on. We can't see it. This is a joke. There's literally nothing between us. It's like the game thinks the wall is still there, even though it's clearly not. Alright Pyrotechnic, you show this beady-eyed naked man what he gets for breaking the rules. We push on to the truck with the device we have to hack. I slowly move around the back to open the door, and as I do, I get a glimpse of an enemy health bar. They're literally right on the other side of the vehicle. We're able to sneak into the vehicle and hack the objective, and then with our final turn, we activate the pod. Now apparently running through this tile that Pyrotechnic is on doesn't activate the pod, but standing stationary on it does. Go figure. So out of desperation or try something, we load the soldiers into the back of the truck and close the door. I'm hoping they won't be able to see us, but of course they can and we immediately come under attack. Oh, and another pod activates too, just because our day wasn't already ruined enough. So we take out the trooper and sectoid from the original pod, and we hide either in or behind the truck to obstruct line of sight on the new pod while we do it. On our next turn, we wipe out the remaining enemies and call it a day. Despite the nonsense that occurred in this mission, the mission was a success, and we had zero injuries. On the next one, we have to save a VIP from the Horde, and the distance we have to travel in five turns seems absolutely mammoth. So I rush out with Cat, and all I can really do is hope for some good luck. It's the only way we'll make the time limit. But you all know my luck score is in the negatives, so of course Cat runs right into some lost. Now thankfully and inexplicably, they don't attack her. Cat makes it to the VIP, and we then race to the evac zone. That went way better than I initially thought it would, so that's cool. Also, this is what a grenade does to a cluster of lost. I hope you enjoy it. We have our first promotions now. I guess that's what happens when you take out 55 enemies on a single mission, even if they are lost. Now, Shredder is an amazing ability. It's not that great in the early game, but it becomes a lifesaver later on when heavily armoured enemies start showing up. Blast padding, meanwhile, seems like straight garbage to me. I mean, it reduces damage taken from explosives. So what? How often do you get hit with an explosive in a campaign? Hopefully not very often. I always take Shredder on my Grenadiers, it just seems like a no-brainer. But I am wondering, are there any blast padding fans out there? It's time for the retaliation mission, and I just really don't want to get the Warlock. He's shown up first in what, the last three challenge runs? And four if you include the Ranger restart? So surely we won't, oh for f sake. Alright, let's do this then. He has Brutal and Regeneration abilities, they're both pretty bad, but at least he's not immune to explosions. That's the one that we really didn't want to see at this stage in the game. His weakness is bewildered, I don't really have much to say on that one. So first pod is a trooper and priest. They're close enough together that we can hit both of them with a grenade. I'm loving this increased AoE size. The priest does survive and hits a stasis on Drifter. Much better than a mind control, so I'm not too worried. As soon as the priest is gone, a faceless reveals, plus a sectoid and trooper activate. This got very dangerous very quickly. Now Leeson missed a 78% chance shot last turn, and this time around he misses a 74% chance shot. He's nothing if not consistent, I guess. Pyrotechnic misses too, so with our two shots that hit, we can only bring down the faceless, and we were kinda lucky to roll enough damage even to do that, to be honest. The sectoid raises a zombie, and the trooper misses its shot against a civilian. That's good for us. But you know what isn't good for us? Pyrotechnic missing an 87% chance to hit. What is happening on this mission? We are missing way too much. Finally, Leeson decides he can hit the side of a barn, and the trooper goes down. Cat then has to use her only grenade to finish the sectoid. Her other items are medikit. Now it's time to face down the warlock. 
He begins by summoning in a trooper, and that's okay. We blow his cover with pyrotechnic, and then Leeson misses a 92% shot. Just so we're clear, this guy has had four shots this mission, the lowest of which was 74% chance to hit. And he's made one out of the four. This is nuts. So obviously the Warlock survives, and on his turn goes for a Mind Scorch. This is better than a Mind Control for sure, but his brutal ability means that we're all losing will. And Cat misses a 72% chance on top. Just what I've come to expect by this point. Now thankfully we are still able to take him down this turn. The Summon Trooper targets a civilian before we take it down. And I have to say that was some truly garbage RNG. And we still got through things without a scratch. For a lesser class that may have been mission failure. But our Grenadiers are holding on. But at this point I'm really hoping that was just a fluke. Not the start of a trend. Well let's put our Grenadiers to the test. We get a bad concealment loss and activate two pods in the process. We have two sectoids and two stun lancers. Uh, okay, make that one stun lancer. We flashbang the lancer and one sectoid. Now the sectoid who still has its faculties raises a zombie. The others attack and miss. Normally I'd be happy about this outcome, but we've just activated a third pod. I'm starting to think our bad RNG is indeed a trend. Here, Cat comes in with a massive clutch critical hit and one-shots the sectoid. Maybe our fortunes are turning around. We take out the Lancer too, but then it's time for the counter-attack. Cat gets panicked, and DJ takes a flanking shot from the captain. Now, fortunately for us, and very unfortunately for him, the captain has taken cover on the high ground. Between our grenade exploding on top of him... And the fall damage, he's gone. A grenade from Pyrotechnic leaves the sectoid exposed. Leeson flanks and... Misses an 86% chance shot. Seriously, what is wrong with this man? The sectoid then targets DJ and takes him out. We've just lost DJ because Leeson is the most incompetent soldier in the history of soldiers. But honestly, I knew trusting this guy would lead us to nothing but ruin. Leeson does finish the sectoid on the next turn after it's well and truly too late to save DJ. You really suck, Leeson. And quite sadly, there's no DJ double up with the recruitment pool either. He really is gone. Maybe I have to make Leeson a dark VIP on the next campaign. Now in some good news, because Lord knows we need it at this point, we've got some sergeants now, so can get the squad size 1 upgrade. An extra soldier on missions is much needed at this point. We have the location scout sit rep on the supply raid mission. This makes the whole map visible to us at all times. That's very nice indeed. We've picked up an acid bomb from a random scanning reward on the strategic layer. It does the same damage as a normal grenade, but inflicts acid burn, which is pretty nice. Anyway, KJ makes the first shot of the mission and lands a 46% on a Viper. KJ, we really could have used you in the last couple of missions. As for the second pod, well, we use five grenades with our five soldiers, and nothing is left standing. And the best thing is we've still got grenades left for the final pod. Now admittedly not that many, but having so many explosives is really great. So that one's done. To be honest, knowing where the pods were allowed us to set up some fantastic ambushes, which is why that mission appeared to be so easy. So what about a protect the VIP until evac arrives mission? Now that's not their technical name I'm sure, but you get my drift. Get it? My drift? Because I'm the... Dr okay, the first pod goes down to an overwatch ambush, and the second pod we just keep tossing grenades at until there is no pod. And there's actually no enemies left on the map after that, so we take our time heading to the VIP, making sure we're set up in a good position. And then the reinforcements come, but we just have so many grenades that these guys can't do anything to us. We're like a bottomless pit of grenades. No matter how many advent come, we just blow them all up. So yeah, another mission success.
As if things weren't bad enough for Advent, we unlock mag cannons here, as well as getting a resistance order that adds plus one to our shredding attacks. I think I understand why the game has been throwing such rubbish AI our way. It's the only chance it has of beating us. Now a kind of cool thing happens here. When we upgrade to mag weapons, Drifter is on a covert op and sustains an injury on it. When he returns and we look to send him on the next mission, he still has his original cannon. He missed out on the upgrade since he wasn't at the base, so we have to equip him with a mag cannon manually. Now this is a nice touch, but it did get me thinking. What if we had weapon mods on his gun? Would his unique gun miss out on getting upgraded to mag level? That could be really annoying, and now I'm probably going to be super paranoid about it. We have another gorilla op, and the first pod we wipe out with ease, and it's just so great never having to worry about cover. If an enemy is in a hard to hit spot, we just blow their cover to smithereens, and now they're not so hard to hit anymore. It's a liberating feeling. But then trouble shows up in the form of the warlock. And even worse, I move forward too quickly and get a bad pot activation. We're not going to be able to take them out this turn, and they have a mech. So I just spread our troops out as much as possible to avoid getting hit with the mech's missile attack. The plan works as we only take a single hit from the trooper. The warlock now sends a zombie in, but that's not too much of a problem for us. We hit back hard on our turn and wipe out the pod. And even here is a good case for grenades. See, the mech has 3 HP remaining. Metla has a 76% chance to hit. But we can just ignore that, use a grenade, and give ourselves a 100% chance to hit. Grenadiers are really, really good. But even though we did wipe out the pod, we activated two turrets in the process. Thankfully, they both miss, and... Well, you probably know what happens next. A grenade each blows up the roof and one-shots both turrets. However, we are running low on grenades at this point. I guess I should have exercised restraint? Now the warlock is here, but I said we were low on grenades, not that we were out of them entirely. We blow up his cover, hit him with drifter's hollow targeting, and then go to town with cannon fire. But before we can celebrate, reinforcements are being dropped in. We use our last frag on the mech and take it out. We're not able to eliminate the troopers, but we do flashbang them. Unfortunately, that doesn't stop one of them from ending failed. He has not been having good luck in the past couple of videos. We take out the trooper who got failed, but the other survives and hits Drifter for big damage. And this is actually going really badly. Can someone hit this guy, please? There we go, good. Now like I said, that did go badly, and I can't even blame Rotten RNG for this one. This was on me. Now in my defense, the game did throw a lot at us here, the Warlock plus reinforcements, and again, a lesser class may have been walled by this mission, but our Grenadiers were able to battle through it. After his injuries, Drifter has picked up a generalized anxiety order. XCOM... <laughs> But are you hitting a little too close to home for me with that one? But the good news is that unlike DJ, there is a failed clone in the recruitment pool. The boy is back in town already. You think your measly bullets can keep this man down, Advent? Think again. We've obtained plated armor by this point. In addition to a HP boost, this allows our grenadiers to carry three items, with the caveat that one of them must be a grenade only. But this means we can take a medikit or the skulljack and still be able to carry two grenades. This is going to be really helpful. The next retaliation mission introduces mutons. This is great since it will lead to us being able to build a plasma grenades. Now this is one of those salvaged UFO maps. And just like in the specialist run, we have some weird line of sight issues going on where we can't see a mech even though we clearly should be able to. And this faceless is standing in the middle of the civilians, and it could do big damage if we can't stop it. But there's no need to worry. We just need to make this 86% chance shot with... Oh god no, with Leeson. Please man, 
please make this shot. Ah! Leeson, no. Why do you insist on sucking so much? Now, the Faceless actually ignores the civilians, which is good, as it could have hit enough of them to lose us the mission right then and there. It instead goes for Pyrotechnic, but pulls a Leeson and also misses. We finish up the Faceless on our turn, and we win the mission. Now, that actually went okay, but I'm starting to think Leeson needs to be kept off the front line. We soon need to venture into the Assassin's territory, we now have plasma grenades, which will make our nades do more damage, as well as advanced grenade launches, which will give our nades a bigger area of effect and allow us to fire them at a greater range. This should be pretty lethal. We have some AP rounds, as well as medikits that we're also using with our extra item slots. I give Leeson the Skulljack, and I think my reasoning for doing so is fairly on point. Leeson will miss with the Skulljack though, eh? Still, it's the most suicidal job we have, so he's doing it. And then on this mission, literally as soon as I'm finished saying we better not blow our concealment on the lost, we... well, you can probably guess what we do. On my way. We don't want to blow our concealment on the lost, though. Oh. They find us. I had to say it, didn't I? I had to say it. I just had to say it. And I thought the specialist run had bad RNG. The game is basically just mocking me at this point. So the assassin arrives. She can summon stun lances, has a chance of returning fire on missed shots, and has the low profile buff, making her harder to hit after the first time. Now those last two abilities synergize quite well with each other. You're more likely to miss when you attack her, and she can return fire when you do. But both can be negated well by explosives, assuming I remember to do that of course. Her weakness is Groundling, which makes her easier to attack from above. That may also help us counter low profile. We have a couple of pods active, and of course, the worst part about Grenadiers on Lost missions is that explosives draw more Lost. But we're in a little bit of trouble here with a Captain, Sectoid, and Spectre all gunning for us. And not to mention the assassin is no doubt closing in at high speed. So I decide bringing in more lost isn't the worst thing in the world. We're relatively safe from them due to being on the high ground in a building. And they may give Advent something to focus on other than us. So let's roar with the sound of our bombs. And I even blow up the ladder leading up to the building just to keep us safer and Advent less safe. But then the blue face demon appears out of nowhere, just like a nightmare. I chase her into the next room and she is gone. Nowhere in sight. It's super creepy. So I lob a grenade randomly. I'm partly trying to hit her and partly just trying to destroy all the other entries into our section of the building. This way no lost will be able to get to us and we'll be safe as long as we stay up here. But we actually get lucky and we do hit the assassin as well. She falls through the floor and we've lost sight on her again. I mean, it was good while it lasted, I guess, all two seconds of it. I try lobbing more grenades down to where she fell, but I can't get the right angle. And now check out this little shield bearer. I don't think I've ever seen an advent soldier fire this accurately. Do you want to swap places with Leeson, shield bro? We could use someone like you. I start to panic when the assassin calls for Harbor Wave, but she's actually targeting the Lost with it, not us. And this is why the Lost can be beneficial to you in these missions. I mostly focus on Advent and the Chosen. It's impossible for the Lost to reach us here, so they're no threat to us at all, and they're keeping Advent busy. Also, while the Chosen is active, none of the supply drops will be picked up. It's the game's way of giving you a bit of a reprieve, so you have time to deal with the Chosen without failing the mission. So given that we're safe up in our demolished little apartment, and we're under no time pressures, I just kind of camp, letting the Lost and Advent wreck each other. This will make things easier for us when we eventually do have to drop down to grab supplies. We gradually whittle down Advent's forces with the help of the Lost. They even attack the Assassin for us. 
and the assassin seems to have no interest in coming up here for us. I used to think she could jump up walls, but now I'm wondering if she actually needs a ladder to get up here, which is why she's leaving us alone. I'm not entirely sure. After a while, all the advent forces are gone. The only one left is the assassin, who is on 1 HP, and really isn't interested in us at all. So I finally start focusing on the lost, taking down as many as I can. But then check this out. The assassin makes a move for the top level. What's going on? Is she coming for us? Well, yes. Yes, she is. See, we shot at one of the lost in this hallway, and by doing so, we blew a hole in the wall that the lost, and by extension the assassin, can use to crawl through to where we are. We have zombies and aliens literally coming out of the goddamn walls. This mission really is like a horror movie. So what do you do in a grenadier-only run when vicious monstrosities are climbing out of the wall to get you? Well, there's only one thing that you can do, of course. You blow up the wall. Yep, we use KJ to obliterate that entire section of the building. No one is getting up to us now. I was hoping to hit the assassin in the blast and finish her, but no luck on that one. And this does lend support to my theory that she needs a ladder to climb up to us. She wasn't coming up here earlier because she had no path to reach us. I'm just thinking I may be able to exploit this in future runs. So without a path to us, she seems to be back on ground level now. And finally, after a mission that's gone for over half an hour by this point, KJ lands the final blow and takes her out. Now that it's just us and the lost, I decide to play more aggressively. We drop down and we start grabbing the loot boxes. Oh, sorry, sorry. I mean the surprise mechanics crates. Sorry, sorry, no. The supply caches. Or caches. No, caches. The supply caches, yeah. And at the end of this slog, we've slain 68 enemies. That's a pretty solid day's work, I reckon. Soon we add the frost bomb to our arsenal and head for the black site. The first pod we see, we recklessly charge out with pyrotechnic and skulljack the captain. In doing so, we activate a second pod. I kind of expected we'd do that, but I just got a bit greedy. We make as many bad guys as we can go boom, and I freeze the trooper. I just didn't want to risk it using its grenade on us. The warlock arrives, of course, while the shield bearer activates its shield, and the codex deploys a psionic bomb. But too bad for it, psionic bombs don't work on our grenade launches. Another weird glitch here, the glow from the psionic bomb has disappeared, if it wasn't for the indicators from the Gotcha Again mod, I would have no way of knowing if I was in the blast radius or not. So that's why we like mods, I guess. We inflict good damage on the Codex, but it does survive with 2 HP and goes for Pyrotechnic, but it thankfully misses. And it's kind of weird it targeted the guy who brought it into this world using the Skulljack. Well, Pyrotechnic targets it back next turn, and... You know how the saying goes, he brought it into this world, he can take... Oh, never mind, he missed a 95% shot. I tell you, this run is absolutely wild. Pyrotechnic is too far from the rest of the squad, so he's going to have to handle this one on his own. Thankfully, the Codex goes for a psionic bomb. This gives Cat enough time to get over there to take the Codex out, while Pyrotechnic can flee the Psy Bomb and reload. All the good a full magazine will do this guy, I'm sure. He can't hit anything anyway. So that was far more annoying than it needed to be, but let's put it behind us and push on. The pod in the main building never actually changes. It's always two base level troops and one base level mech. So even if you do this mission with beam weapons and a full squad of colonels, that pod will still be the same. I guess it's kind of like the sector pod on the forge mission or the gatekeeper on the psionic gate mission just a much weaker version. But once we've blown through them, I get a glimpse of a pot of vipers, and that's obviously a little more alarming. I try some cheese by grenading them from beyond line of sight, but they keep moving, so it doesn't really work. I then decide we have to go down and face them, like big brave dogs, instead of cowardly mice. It really sucks, I tell you that. We take out two of them and flashbang the third, so it can't poison us. 
and the AoE of the flashbang with the advanced grenade launcher is absolutely Herculean. It's awesome. So once the last snack girl is taken care of, we regroup on the roof with the intention of pushing ahead to the warlock, but there's actually no need as he comes charging into us. Same deal as usual, grenade and hollow target to kick things off, and then unload as many cannons as needed into him. He goes down before he can really do anything, and I think the map is now clear of enemies actually. So we take the vial and we head on home before the reinforcements can do anything against us. That was great work by the team, except for pyrotechnic obviously, and we've reduced the avatar progress by two. But now my good people, it's time for my favourite sit rep, the savage sit rep. So this one means only beast enemies will be on the map, stun lancers, faceless, berserkers and chrysalids. Now it's not as good getting it now as it is in the early game, as you can have other aliens than just faceless, but we've still got some faceless, and that's going to mean more mimic beacons for us. Assuming we can survive, of course. But we've secured our first captain, we're able to deploy six soldiers now, and our grenades can inflict critical hits too. Valen, eat your heart out. But the problem is we've got all three pods on top of us and two of them have berserkers. We freeze the faceless and take out the lancers and then in come the berserkers. One of our soldiers, Master Chief, named so because, well, because he looks like a very budget version of Master Chief. Well, he's knocked unconscious and KJ is stunned for his whole turn. I can't even with this game anymore. So I have to call an emergency evac and destroy the relay as we escape. We won't get the reward or the mimic beacon resources, which is even worse, but we've at least stopped the dark event, so that's something. Of course, KJ is still stunned and has to survive the onslaught of two berserkers and two faceless to make it out alive. Let's see how he goes. The first Berserker doesn't attack for some reason, so that's good. The Faceless misses. Awesome. Second one hits, but we're alive. Darn. The final Berserker finishes KJ off. I really thought he had a chance there. Oh well. Rest in peace, my friend. But the Lords of the RNG Throne aren't done with my weary, broken soul just yet. No, no, no. Now we've got the UFO defense mission right after that dumpster fire that we just evac'd out of. And just like last time, quite a few of our high level soldiers are tired. That's never a good thing. So on the stream, I outline our very detailed battle strategy. It's real simple. We see them, we murder them. So now that we've got a foolproof plan, we charge out into the night. But the pods have spawned way closer than they normally do on this mission, and we activate three all at once. We begin the mayhem by wiping out a muton, sectoid, and trooper using only two grenades. Not a bad start. We burn through three more to take down two mechs and a priest, and while using so many grenades, on what is literally the first turn of the mission is not an ideal scenario, several of our soldiers do have the heavy ordnance ability, letting them carry a third grenade. And as an aside, I've been calling that ability heavy ordnance for the last six years since this game released. It's only now that I'm writing this script, I've discovered that ordnance isn't even a word. I feel a little bit silly, I have to be honest with you. But whatever, this is an English class. So we spend our last turn launching another grenade and take a trooper down. We just destroyed seven enemies in one turn. Now that's not bad given how bleak things were looking only a few moments ago. Some more enemies drop in, but thankfully the sectoid wastes its turn by raising a zombie. Very nice. We get a reinforcement from the Avenger, and our boy Paul Green is back. And even if the reinforcements aren't at a high level, every single one of them is giving us at least two more grenades to work with. That's actually really useful. 
failed flashbangs all the non-zombie enemies, and because it hits the sectoid, that causes the zombie to go down, which is kind of ironic. And the great thing now is the Codex won't spawn any clones when we hit it. And even though Drifter misses his shot on the Muton, his stock finishes it off regardless. I stupidly use the Frost Bomb on the Codex, as I think I'm out of actions, and Red Devil's shot on it is a measly 46% chance. But it turns out we haven't actually used Pyrotechnic yet, so he finishes it off. We didn't need to use that Frost Bomb, and just like that I'm feeling very silly again. And now they're already sending reinforcements, and I'm guessing it's because we've eliminated so many enemies. There's still more waiting for us at the beacon though. Drifter does our blue screen rounds to take out the Codex, but they don't help when he misses. But here's the thing, because the stock still does a single point of damage, the Codex spawns a clone, and now there's two of them. The worst possible scenario. Looks like Leeson has some competition for the most useless soldier in the barracks. However, thanks to a lucky crit and some of the other soldiers also having blue screen rounds, we're still able to take down the entire pod regardless. A stun lancer and priest drop down on us, but we also get a reinforcement in the form of monocle, and that means two more grenades. The priest survives thanks to sustain, but we are able to destroy the disruptor. Another priest and lancer later, and the earlier priest shows off why they are so annoying on this mission. So all we care about right now is falling back to the Avenger as quickly as possible. But the priest hits Chan with a stasis, so she's not going anywhere this turn, which means we have to dig in to defend her. So then we have a mech and three stun lancers drop in. Then the priest hits Chan with a mind control and... Well, you can see what happens for yourself. Yeah, the mind control has caused Failed to panic, and then Failed's panic has caused Drifter to panic. And I actually cracked up laughing watching this footage back. This is just ridiculous. So the best I can do is a frost bomb on the priest, which ends the mind control. That doesn't help our two panic boys trembling in the fetal position, mind you. So let's see how many of these stun lancers we can finish off. Well, two of them survive, but one thankfully doesn't attack, and the other one misses. So not totally bad RNG, just mostly bad RNG. So on our turn, we shoot at one of the lancers three times, and it dodges three times. Once the other lancer is disposed of, we head to the Avenger, and to be honest, at this point, if anyone else gets stasis or mind controlled or knocked out or anything else, they're getting left behind. I don't even care anymore. Now, lucky for our troops, that doesn't happen and everyone makes it out alive. My goodness, what a crazy mission. Next, we have a retaliation mission and I really want some faceless corpses. Now, for some reason, we only picked up one on the second retaliation mission, as opposed to the usual two that you normally get. I'm not sure why this happened, but it has meant that we've gone this far in the campaign without a single Mimic Beacon. But the problem we have right now is that the roster is just so depleted. We've only got four soldiers who aren't tired, three of which are sergeant rank or lower. And as if that wasn't bad enough in of itself, one of these soldiers is Leeson. Oh lord, please have mercy on our souls. I add Chan to the group, even though she's tired, and we set out with five troops in total. Now the first thing I notice on this mission is we have to cross over a creek bed with no cover in order to reach the civilians. So that sounds like it's going to go really well, doesn't it? The second thing I notice is the assassin dropping in. Then this idiot resistance trooper shoots at a codex causing it to clone, and I'll give you some time to guess where you think the clone may spawn in. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you guessed right on top of us, then you are absolutely correct. Now the pod is active, and we can't even see where the rest of it is. Then another pod with a muton activates. We take the muton down, but the sectoid with it hits Metla with a flanking shot. The original Codex then psionic bombs us. With the help of the resistance fighters, we're able to take down all the active enemies on the next turn. When we encounter the assassin, she seems to be glitched. She's not invisible, and she doesn't scatter to take cover. I'm thinking maybe the resistance operatives already activated her, that's why she's not responding. I don't really know what's going on here. Anyway, she's too far away to get many attacks off, so she does survive for her turn. She charges right at Hoffman and dazes her, and this causes Chan to panic. From five soldiers to three, just like that. We're still able to take out the assassin on the next turn, but that still leaves a whole heap of enemy pods that are still out there. We're able to take a lot of them down, but we're in a predicament. If we lose one more civilian, the region is done. We've got two berserkers and a faceless in this building, but thankfully Metla has one last frost bomb he can use to keep them at bay. However, as he does so, he activates this muton. This is really bad. If this thing gets off one shot on a civilian next turn, it's over. We lose the region. So we're down to our last soldier with action points left apart from Metla. Who's it gonna be? Yeah. Leeson needs to make a 63% shot on this muton, or it could cost us the whole region. Oh dear. So he shoots, and what do you know, he scores. Leeson finally actually makes a clutch shot. Maybe this is a sign of good things to come. Anyway, that one was a really tough mission. But at least we can build one single Mimic Beacon. So that's something, I guess. Oh, and we also pick up all of these negative traits at the same time. Awesome. I heal up at Templar HQ, and this situation is pretty dire. Like, the Avatar project is almost full, there's a covert op to lower it, but a sergeant is required, and we don't have a single healthy sergeant or above. And I am recruiting rookies and training them in the GTS, I seemingly just can't train them quickly enough. I think it's just bad timing of having the black site, the base defense, and a retaliation mission all so close together. We skip the next mission in order to heal up. This does mean losing the region, but I can get it back with enough intel. Keeping our troops alive is more important at this stage. And on this guerrilla op, something weird happens. Every enemy on the map, all nine of them, decide to stand in pretty much the exact same spot. Now I'm guessing they were all moving towards us due to upthrottling, and decided they would all use the same path to get to us. Well, we hit them with a frost bomb, and that's it. The whole map is frozen. We then just keep chucking grenades at these helpless Aelomars until there's none left standing. This might be my favourite mission in this game ever and it has completely made all the previous headaches worth it. This was just awesome.
On the next council mission, we use a Mimic Beacon for the first time the entire run. And despite how rough this has been due to all the weird stuff that has happened, I think this demonstrates how good Grenadiers are. We're in the month of July in the game, and some other classes simply wouldn't have made it this far without being able to use a Mimic Beacon. And speaking of weird stuff, look at this one. I've put the Skulljack on this noob, Evans, she's not even good enough to have a nickname yet. The Codex shoots at her and misses, but it does hit the floor under her. She falls down into a pit of Lost and is immediately torn apart. It would have actually been better if the Codex had just hit her with its shot, as she'd have taken less damage that way. So I guess we won't be Skulljacking any Codexes this mission, I just... This is just unreal, the amount of terrible luck and just weird things that we are getting in this run. Alright, let's try that Skulljack again. And this time on the Forge mission. The Avatar progress bar is full, so I'm looking to reduce it in a major way. The first pod gets annihilated and we push on, and we keep our recent trend of meeting the Sector pod on our side of the bridge... Well, Drifter has Chain Shot now, so combined with Shred and Blue Screen Rounds, I don't think this Sector Pod is going to be hanging around very long. Unless, of course, we miss the first 85% Chain Shot, because why wouldn't we? Now, for those who don't know, Chain Shot is kind of a poor man's Rapid Fire. It fires twice like Rapid Fire, but only if the first shot hits. If it doesn't, you don't even get to attempt the second shot. Thankfully, Cat does better, and she does land her chain shots. Failed finishes the big tin can off, but then we're instantly ambushed by the assassin. She does hit Pyrotechnic, but we take out her and her summon Stun Lancer without too much difficulty. And then the moment that we've all been waiting for, Leeson uses the Skulljack on a Codex, and he lands the hit. We use a frost bomb to stop the avatar from teleporting, then use a grenade to destroy its cover. Drifter's chance to hit is 86%, but I know better than to trust that, and I go for hail of bullets instead. This is a really good ability. It gives you a shot that is guaranteed to hit, but it uses up more ammunition than usual. Now, we can't take out the avatar, but I'm not worried since it's frozen. Except, apparently, it's not frozen. It mind controls Cat like it was nothing. I really don't understand why it didn't stay frozen there. Uh, comment section, have you guys got any ideas? We charge out with Leeson, who makes a clutch shot again. This man is really turning his reputation around. But there's two problems with this. One is that he activates a pot of codexes while he does it. The second is that the avatar is now teleporting around again. It's not frozen anymore. We flashbang all the enemies with failed, but then have to send Metler out of cover to finish off the avatar. But it's no worries as we take out all the enemies with enough grenades. And since the codexes are disoriented, we don't have to worry about them cloning. That actually could have gone much worse. So we then regroup and set our sights on the main building. Now by this point we've taken out a sector pod, the assassin, and an avatar in one mission, and we still have multiple grenades at our disposal. So with that in mind, the last pod is not an issue, and we all live to tell the tale. Oh, and I thought this was funny in a kind of silly way too. Pyrotechnic is wounded for eight days, but Leeson is gravely wounded for only four days. So I'm not sure how that one adds up. So we have a guerrilla op, but I'm forced to send low-level soldiers. Between the casualties we've taken and the Grenadiers' naturally slow level-up progression, we only have six soldiers at captain level or above, which is enough for one squad. 
So that squad can handle themselves really well, but everyone else, not so much. The Lost are present on this mission, and I do love encountering these guys outside of the old city maps. It just feels like a breath of fresh air when it happens. But on this one, they really do slow down our progress. I'm talking half a dozen turns of just fending them off, to the point we have to rush to the objective, ignoring cover, in no small part because we've blown all the cover up, leaving our soldiers exposed. And I know shooting at the Lost is obviously a better option, but with such low-level grenadiers, their aim is just awful. So sometimes grenades are necessary just to be able to inflict damage, because it's either that, or risk a really high chance of missing the shot. And I mean, you guys have seen the misses that were having this run, so it's a natural fear to have. And to make matters worse, as soon as we get near the objective to hack it, Advent reinforcements get called in. I evac with the team, but this newbie, Julie Baker, has to hack the objective, so she can't bail out this turn. She's stuck there. So before the other soldiers evac, we use them to either freeze, disorient, or eliminate as many enemies as we can to try and give Baker a chance. But the area is still swarming with bad guys, so I'm not holding my breath. Well, the mech is frozen, so we don't have to worry about that. The shield bearer only targets lost, that's really good. And for some reason that is inexplicable to me, the Captain and Stun Lancer both go on Overwatch. Now even better, the Captain guns down the Lost that is rushing towards Baker. So Baker takes a single hit from a Lost, and she has 2 HP remaining. If that other Lost had been able to attack her, she might not have made it. So just to recap, an Advent Captain just saved Baker's life. I'm telling you, this run is bonkers. We get some promotions, but Grenadiers don't start getting their best abilities until Lieutenant level, excluding Shred, which is amazing, of course. Now, the A-Team is mostly still resting up. They're shaken from having taken on too many missions, including the Forge. But here, we've got an opportunity to save Master Chief. See, he was only knocked out when we lost him, not eliminated. So Red Devil and Metla accompanied by a squad of mostly corporals, set off to retrieve our boy. And we don't even have to rescue him from a cell, which means he escaped on his own. What a beast of a man. So the first pod goes down without issue, but then things start getting a little bit hairy. We activate an Andromedon and two codexes. And the Andromedon climbs a roof across the street, and it seems like it's a million miles away from us. There's no way we're getting to it this turn, and even if we could, I get a glimpse of an Archon, so going near it will mean activating another pod anyway, which we obviously don't want to do. So we take out the Codexes, but it does take up a few grenades, but then I do the absolute dumbest thing that I've done possibly in any of these challenge videos. And you guys know I've done some dumb things in these challenge videos. I don't throw down the Mimic Beacon to distract the Andromedon. I was hoping that it would be too far away to attack us, but I was wrong, and it has cost us big time. It sends an acid bomb onto half our squad, and we're in big trouble. Not only have our troops taken huge damage, but the acid will continue to inflict burn damage until we evac, or until they drop to the ground. And you know that pod with the Archon? Well, it activates. Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse. So a soldier named Klaus Wolf falls to acid burn on our turn, and he was the guy who had the Mimic Beacon. So we can't use that anymore. Two more soldiers, Laurent and Delgado, are likely to go down next turn too. Oh, but it gets even worse. We activate a third pod at the start of our turn. And this mission is one with a set evac zone, so we can't even run away. The acid burn soldiers have no chance of surviving at this point. So I send them down to the front line to do as much damage. 
and to draw as much fire as possible before they're gone for good. An epic last stand for these uh, lucky individuals. Meanwhile, the Spectre makes a clone of Red Devil. She had the Frost Bomb, so we can't use that either. One of the Archons bashes Master Chief's skull in, and then our acid-covered troops succumb to their wounds. So now it's just Metla and Paul Green left. Everyone else is gone. Now thankfully Metla is able to one-shot the Red Devil clone, so we get her back, and then we just start sprinting to the evac zone. If we're lucky, maybe a soldier or two will make it out of this hellstorm alive. Well, an Andromedon fist into green ensures he won't be one of those one or two soldiers who make it out alive. Metla also takes a whack from the Archon, but he does survive. And here, the problem for poor Metla is that the entire alien swarm is between him and the evac zone. So I do something a bit odd, and I actually start running the opposite way. I'm just trying to find a spot out of line of sight. Maybe we'll be able to double back around to the evac zone, or even if I can just keep him alive until the turn timer runs out, then we may get a chance at a rescue mission later in the game. Because, you know, this rescue mission has gone so well after all. Now, meanwhile, Red Devil is one move away from the evac zone. If she can just hold on for this turn, she's home free. Well, no, the Spectre makes a clone, so she's out too. So we frantically run through the city with Metla, just trying to avoid the enemies from spotting us. I think we'll be safe on a roof, but I'm wrong yet again on this mission. From the other side of the building, we hear a violent rattling, only to see a grenade tumbling towards our feet. A grenade launched by none other than the Red Devil clone. This one's over. It's a squad wipe. Now this doesn't happen to me very often. It's rare I lose a whole team. And in our attempt to save one soldier, we've lost seven. On top of that, we've lost the Mimic Beacon and the Frost Bomb as well. The Frost Bomb we may be able to get back if we get a rescue mission for Red Devil, and we don't get utterly annihilated in that rescue mission as well. But the real problem here is losing so many troops. Our barracks was already spread too thin, with our high-level soldiers constantly being tired or injured, and now that barracks has just lost about a third of its roster. And as if all that wasn't enough of a kick to the guts, the Warlock has just picked up immunity to explosives. And I have to be honest here, this is the most helpless I've felt in an XCOM campaign in ages. And certainly the most helpless for any of these challenge runs. I certainly did not expect that from the Grenadiers of all classes. I thought this was going to be an easy run. And I did consider restarting the campaign here. How can we possibly hope to come back from this? Lights out, lying in your arms And these feelings start to change One look into your eyes And I'm floating No no, 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 we cannot let their sacrifice be in vain. We cannot let Advent win. We are turning the tides on this campaign, no matter what. Alright, so what's this? A retaliation mission? Well, we could use a new Mimic Beacon, so I say let's bring it on.
So not perfect, but we've proven we're not out of the fight just yet. We're also able to bring back Red Devil and Metla thanks to the recruitment pool double up glitch. They are of course rookies, so we'll have to retrain them. And I then spend quite a chunk of time placing the high level soldiers in the infirmary to remove their negative traits. We just can't risk that causing us to lose a mission at this stage. So once they're all healthy, I want to send them into the Warlock's base, but the Avatar progress is filled. So in the meantime, we're going to hit the Psionic Gate mission with, well, with these people. High level, they are not. But let's cross our fingers and hope the odds are forever in our favour on this one. And we do have beam cannons by this stage, so that should definitely help us. So the Hunter shows up. He has Shadow Step, Kinetic Plating, Mech Lord, and Watchful. Now Kinetic Plating is a pain. He'll generate shielding every time we miss an attack on him. But to be honest, none of his abilities really matter that much. And that's because of his weakness. Shell Shocked. This guy takes increased damage from explosions. So I really don't think he's going to be much of a threat to us. Now my strategy for this one was to try and remember where the chrysalids were hidden, as the game does show you that information at the start of the mission, and then I was going to use grenades to force them above ground. And if you were wondering, yes grenades will hurt chrysalids that are burrowed underground. I've loaded a few troopers up with medikits too as a backup, and we do need to use them on occasion. So the grenading the ground strategy works pretty well, and we push through the chrysalids and encounter the gatekeeper. Now with hollow targeting and multiple soldiers who can shred, it goes down pretty easily. We do have to use the mimic beacon to distract it for a turn, but this was mostly because of a bad chrysalid activation at the same time. But we do still have the hunter to contend with, of course. Our grenades are doing big damage on him, as you would expect, but he's just a little too far away, meaning some of our soldiers can't get into attack range, so he hangs on for this turn. And then he summons in two mechs, one of which is a heavy. And he dazes two of our troops with his gas grenade. So yeah, it turns out this guy is actually a bit of a threat after all. But even worse than that, between the daze, being low on grenades, and the terrible accuracy of our low level soldiers, we can't take out the Hunter or the Heavy Mech on the next turn either. So we get bombarded with missiles and Monocle takes a hit from the Hunter's rifle. It causes bleed as well. And we've used up all our medikits. So we really need to end this mission quickly or we're going to have another casualty on our hands. So a soldier nicknamed Nitro hits the Hunter to take him out. And despite missing an 88% shot, because of course we do, we're still able to finish the mech as well. And thank goodness that's over. The entire team is injured. Monocle had 1 HP left, so he barely survived. But nonetheless, a win's a win, and four of these troops gain promotions, so that should hopefully help us going forward. We complete research on Warden armor, but we don't have enough resources, alloys, or Illyrium to actually build it. And we're really broke in this run for some reason. I guess we are spending a lot of supplies on new recruits, but even the other items we're running low on as well. Okay, so now that we've lowered the Avatar progress, now we can send the A-Team in to hit the Warlock Stronghold. His power level is just getting too high, and we really don't want him to attack us and force another Avenger defense mission. So we kick things off with a pod of four Berserkers. Quite the welcoming party from the Warlock. Now we take down one of them with Overwatch, so that's something, but we're still looking at another three with a total of 72 HP to get rid of this turn. So the first shot of our turn misses, but because Cat has a stock, it still inflicts minimal damage, sending the Berserker into enraged mode. Well, you are not nearly as enraged as I am at this point, my dear. This is literally the worst case scenario. It would have been better to do no damage, as at least then we'd still have the Mimic Beacon as a backup option. But with the Berserker enraged, the Mimic Beacon isn't going to help us with it. 
So we're still able to take down two of them. We have quite a few chain shots by this point. And the sole survivor doesn't attack us. Either because it was too far away or because it didn't have line of sight on us at the start of the turn. I'm not really sure, but it's good news either way. So after finishing off the last Berserker, we march on. The next pod is three Advent Soldiers and two Turrets. It's not great, but Pyrotechnic has picked up Serial as a hidden ability, and we make good use of it here, being able to take down every single enemy. The pod at the Elevator is surprisingly easy. Just an Archon and Muton, only two enemies... I guess the Warlock figured no one would make it past the Berserkers anyway, so it didn't matter what he put here. But we take them down with ease, and then activate the Elevator. Another Berserker in the main chamber, this time accompanied by a Chrysalid. We do big damage with Overwatch, but Cat randomly catches on fire for some reason. And I have no idea how or why this happened. There's not even any flames anywhere in the room. But whatever, it's easy to put out with Hunker Down, and I'm actually starting to become desensitised to the nonsensical happenings in this run by this stage. So when the Warlock arrives, we begin by grenading him. Even though he's immune, it still wrecks his cover and shreds his armour. We then land a Rupture Shot. Now this is a great ability. It means the Warlock will take extra damage from the rest of our attacks for this turn. And take extra damage he does. Failed lands a massive 24 damage with a single shot. It is a sight to see. And so needless to say, the Warlock goes down pretty quickly. Now I know what you're wondering, dear viewer. Well, actually, you're probably not. But I'm going to tell you anyway, because I think it's interesting. So Banish with the Reapers didn't work on the Sarcophagus. Rapid Fire kind of worked, but not really. Well, ladies and gentlemen... I'm pleased to say that Chain Shot does indeed work with the Sarcophagus. And this is awesome news for us. Finally, we found one thing that Chain Shot does better than Rapid Fire. And as a totally random aside, writing this script, I spelt Sarcophagus as Saku Hugs. And I cracked up laughing way more than I should have. Like, it, it's not even close. It doesn't even sound right. Anyway, I thought it was funny. So the reinforcements are a Codex and Chrysalid. Three shots take them both out, and we return our focus to the Sarcophagus. I use Rupture on it, but it doesn't give the other troops any damage bonus, so that's a bit of a bummer. I could have used a Chain Shot with Drifter to finish it off, but I actually thought a regular shot would do enough damage to destroy it. It doesn't. So either I miscounted the health bar, or the game is giving me more shenanigans, at this point, both scenarios seem equally likely, to be honest. So more reinforcements. An Archon and a Priest this time. Bigger health pools and not susceptible to blue screen rounds. So that's not good for us. The Priest survives with Sustain, but we take out everything else, including the Sarcophagus. The Priest does Mind Control Pyrotechnic, who is our stronger soldier, but we quickly take the Priest down, so it doesn't matter. The Warlock has 75% health when he returns. Now you saw how he fared last time with 100% health, so you can probably guess that he doesn't do much better here, and we wipe him from the face of the earth in a single turn. Go us. So our A-team is certainly getting more powerful. Between Hail of Bullets, Rupture, and Chain Shot, we've got a lot of very useful tools to work with. And given the Warlock was probably the most dangerous of the three chosen due to his explosives immunity, this actually bodes quite well for us. <laughs> and to be perfectly honest, things do continue going in our favour. The missions where we send the lower level troops usually result in an injury or two, but we're winning missions and we're not losing any soldiers. So given where we were earlier, things are really on track. And before long, we actually complete all the story research. So we could finish the game, but there's still two chosen out there, and I really don't want them showing up on the final mission. So we need to hit their bases too. So let's get the assassin first, as she's likely to be more dangerous than the hunter. Better to just get her out of the way early, then we don't have to worry. 
Now, the first pod is a weird one. A mech, a spectre, and two advent soldiers. The mech goes into Overwatch, and it's far enough away that our hit chances aren't super great. And hail of bullets really comes in useful for these situations. We can use it to remove the Overwatch, and then we can move in on the pod with everyone else to get better aim, and we finish them off quite easily. But you know, this run is gonna this run. These chrysalids are in an entirely different room, and they activate on our last action for some reason. Now, two of them burrow underground, or under metal, as it were, but this one gets to attack us, and Drifter gets poisoned. What is this nightmare reality I've stumbled into? And how do I get out of it? Silent Hill flashbacks are hitting me, and they're not pretty. I mean, I have no idea how these things saw us. We were so far away. Whatever. It's cool. It's fine. We'll survive. So, of course, Cat misses a 97% shot. Now, thankfully, she does have a stock, so the chrysalid falls regardless. But I did have to point it out. Another 97% miss. Now, the two chrysalids who burrowed under the floor, I decide just to leave. If we don't go near them, they shouldn't disturb us. Or maybe they will. Once we move too far away, they actually burrow out on their own and start chasing us. They're after us. They want us quite badly, it seems. But sometimes, little chrysalids, you have to be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. The rest of the initial area goes off without a hitch, and down the elevator we go. The advent soldiers waiting for us at the bottom of the elevator don't cause any issues. Once the assassin spawns in, we thankfully locate her quite quickly, and we hit her with a grenade. Her cover is indestructible though, so I decide to flank with pyrotechnic. The problem with this is that he's now out of cover. I try for a rupture but miss, which causes the assassin to fire back and hit. That is absolutely terrible. We use a couple of hail of bullets to bypass her full cover, but we can't take her out this turn. So she calls in some stun lances, and she also hits Leeson before disappearing again. We use some movement preview cheese to work out where she is, and this time our rupture hits. We're able to finish her off, but the stun lances are a different story. Mainly because one of them dodged and survived a hit it otherwise wouldn't have. So here I'm forced to use the mimic beacon, and that's really bad. I would have much preferred to use it next turn on the reinforcements. And it's kind of crazy how one miss with rupture has just caused so many problems for us. So the reinforcements are here, and as if an Andromedon and Codex wasn't bad enough news, the first Stun Lancer gets a crit and one-shots the Mimic Beacon. This allows the second to hit Cat and disorient her. This run really, really sucks sometimes. So we take out the Stun Lancer and use Chain Shot on the Andromedon. Awesome, we miss an 89% chance to hit. We use another chain shot and we're able to get the Andromedon to second form, but then two Archons come in, more high HP enemies. And at this point, we've only done a measly eight damage to the sarcophagus. This is awful. The Codex and Andromedon go for Pyrotechnic, but both attacks thankfully miss. Then thanks to Serial, we're able to finish the Andromedon and the Sarcophagus on our turn, but this still leaves the Codex and the Archons. Not to mention the Assassin is back now. Well, she may be back, but I have no idea where she is, and half our squad has just had their weapons jammed from the Codex, so we can only attack with grenades even if we do find her. I reposition and reload with most of the squad, and try two attacks on one of the Archons, both in the 80s range to hit. The first one's a miss, and the second one's a dodge. Which is brilliant. I just love this. And so my plan is to just wait for the assassin to come to us. I can't afford the action points to go looking for her. And amazingly, on this turn, we don't lose anyone, despite coming under an absolute plethora of attacks. 
However, the assassin does hit Drifter and dazes him. One more attack and he'll be gone, so we need to finish this one up. Too bad the assassin is on the other side of the map, in full, indestructible cover. Thankfully we have hail of bullets, but even with hollow targeting, Cat's chance to hit is an abysmal 15%. Now hollow targeting adds a 15% chance to hit, I believe, so without it, her chance to hit would be literally zero. So if hail of bullets is on cooldown, we're using grenades. I realised very quickly there's simply no way we're going to do enough damage to take her out this turn, so I try to eliminate some of the other enemies. This will at least reduce the damage that we take. Well, first shot on the Archon, an 87% chance miss. Second attack, a 66% chance that results in another dodge. Failed has the flashbang, so we use that, and at least that can't miss or be dodged. And then it happens. The Archon, disoriented as it is, takes aim at Leeson and fells him. I mean, I would feel bad for Leeson, but I guess now he knows how DJ feels, so whatever. The Assassin blasts Drifter and Failed with Harbor Wave, and they're both dazed. Alright, 69% chance of landing the Rupture with Cat. We really need this. If this misses, we're probably all going to die. Yep. It missed. The assassin didn't miss with the return fire though. Cat is still alive, but she's bleeding out on the ground and doesn't have long. So how many soldiers are we down to now? I think two? Now thankfully Chan can revive Drifter, so that's something. And thankfully Pyrotechnic connects with the 72% chance rupture. So it comes down to a 96% shot with Chan. Can we make it? Yes, thankfully we can. And honestly, a miss would not have surprised me at all. But sanity thankfully prevails in this instance. Now Cat will survive, but we've lost a very high level soldier in Leeson, and it's mostly just because of yet more ridiculous RNG. I was so incredibly frustrated at this point. This whole run just defies reality. And there's no lease and double up in the recruit pool either, so he's proper gone. We get the continental bonus that allows heavy weapons to be made instantly in the proving grounds. I try for a blaster bomb, but of course we don't get one. And in fact, we get two shredstorm cannons, and yet no blaster bomb. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised, but I'm pretty tired of RNG at this point, I gotta be real. So we hit an avatar facility housing an alien ruler. Partly because we can turn it into an unwilling organ donor, and partly because the avatar progress is filling up. So first shot on the mission, and it's a miss, of course. We're still able to take out the pod, mostly because Hoffman has again picked up death from above, but at the rate that we're going through soldiers, I'm not going to get too attached to having this ability. We may not have it for long. So we send Pyrotechnic up the ridge to scout the facility, and we immediately find ourselves face to face with the Viper King himself. Now he goes down the ridge, of course, and has line of sight on the whole squad, minus Pyrotechnic. And we're clustered so close together that his freeze ability is going to devastate us. I should have kept the troops more spread out, but I was pretty frustrated by this point in the run, and that was most likely affecting my judgement. So because Pyrotechnic is out of line of sight, he can attack with his grenade and not cause a reaction turn from the king. Then Hoffman hits the chain shot, and we've actually inflicted so much damage that instead of attacking us, he summons his psionic portal to run away. And then we hit a second chain shot before he retreats. Now things are starting to go our way. And there's really nothing to worry about with the rest of the mission, one less avatar facility for advent. But not all is perfect. Look at the squad for this next mission. And I think that sums up how this run is going. We are at the end of October, and we're using a squad of mostly sergeants and below. Now if you're new to this game, this is not indicative of a winning strategy. 
But, to be fair, they still complete the mission with only one injury, so credit where it's due, I guess. And then, after six Illyrium cores, we finally get a blaster bomb. And we also get a covert op for our beam weapons to do plus one damage, so that's sounding pretty nice. Then on a gorilla op, the Viper King returns for round two, but he only has 16 HP left, so I don't really like his chances. And I guess getting those Shredstorm cannons earlier wasn't the worst thing after all. We're able to use one here, and because we're using it from behind a wall where the king can't see us, he doesn't even get a reaction turn. So he goes down for the count, and he didn't attack us at all this entire campaign. So again, maybe our fortune has finally turned. But in all likelihood, I'll probably be complaining about RNG again in a couple of minutes, I'm sure. Alright, let's hit the Hunter's base. Hoffman has the Viper King armor at this stage, for the obvious synergy with Death from Above. The first pod is all Chrysalids. Now Nitro has picked up Rapid Fire as a hidden ability, and like I was saying earlier, Rapid Fire is just a better version of Chain Shot. So it's pretty wild that Grenadiers can even get this ability at all. Now I go to use it on a lid, but we actually take it down in a single shot. We don't even need the second one. And because of the damage buff we received earlier, there is a chance Chrysalids are a one-shot with our cannons, but it's not guaranteed. But it's pretty wild that we have the chance of doing a whopping 12 damage with a single shot. So, as you can probably guess, the pod goes down pretty easily. We wreck the rest of the pods we come across in the first area. There's really not much to say here. And the welcome party down below is an Archon and Stun Lancer. We blow up the Stun Lancer's cover, and this is actually the first grenade we've used for the whole mission. Our Grenadiers are having to rely on explosives a lot less as they become stronger, and we should remember here that our cannons get two upgrades while our grenades only get one. So it does make sense that the nades have been a little outpaced by this point. But not against the Hunter. Thanks to his explosive weakness, he takes massive damage, as much as the cannons would inflict with a regular shot. But the grenades also have the bonus that they always hit, and they can't be dodged. And Hoffman is an absolute beast here. She finishes the hunter off, but then thanks to death from above, can use chain shot on the sarcophagus. But let's not stop with one chain shot, let's use another. Oh, the second shot didn't hit. That's a bummer. So I guess it's not as great for the sarcophagus as I thought. It does still have a chance to miss. And Drifter's second shot misses as well. So some definite shenanigans going on here. But Nitro is not playing, and both of her chain shots connect, destroying the sarcophagus. And we don't even need the Mimic Beacon. We just lay waste to the reinforcements then and there. This is going really well. And since the Hunter returns with only 50 HP, he goes down like it was nothing. That was way better than the Assassin base assault. So it finally feels like we're eclipsing the aliens at this point, but it has taken way longer than I would have expected. And now that I've decided on the A-Team, I make use of some soldier bonds. And then I decide it's time to wrap this campaign up. We're sending a major and a captain into the network tower, which is pretty sad. And I could wait to level them up. But to be honest, I'm really over this campaign by this point, And we should be able to handle things with the soldiers and gear that we have. So we're just going to do it. Now with this Viper, I'm really confused for a moment. The pod hasn't activated, even though we have line of sight. And I actually worked out it was because one of our intel upgrades for this mission extended our line of sight. So Red Devil can see this thing, but it can't see her. At least that's what I think is going on anyway. So we shoot, miss, and then it does activate, along with an Andromedon. Not great. We're too far away to grenade the Andromedon so it lives, but it's also too far away to grenade us. And we do have tactical analysis by this point, 
so all it does is move towards us on its turn. So that's going to make destroying you much easier for us, Mr. Andromedon. I appreciate your help in this matter. And once we send it into second form, it really has no chance. It can only punch us, and it's so far away that it's going to be slag before it can get into punching range. Unless it falls back to another Andromedon, of course. Oh dear. So we focus fire on the new Andromedon and send it to its second form, while taking out the original as well. And the remaining metal husk is too far away to attack us on its turn, so we take it out pretty easily as well. But there was a spectre in the pod, and it makes a clone of Red Devil, but even with only two soldiers, we've got ample firepower to end the spectre and get our soldier back, thank you very much. But of course, Advent's not done yet. They throw an Andromedon and two Archons at us. Now that's a pretty nasty pod. We send the Andromedon to second form, and get this, it gets two actions despite tactical analysis. And I'm guessing this is because the Andromedon shell wasn't actually activated on our turn, the Andromedon itself was, if that makes sense. But the shell counts as a new enemy, so tactical analysis doesn't get applied to it. The more you know, I guess. And two of our soldiers are in range of blazing pinions, but if they move, they're going to take acid burn thanks to the Andromedon shell. It's really a no-win situation, but I choose to take the blazing pinions. They at least don't give ongoing damage, unlike the acid. Nitro takes a hit from both Archons, but she thankfully dodges one of them and survives. For once, Dodge Cheese is working in our favour. So we're finally able to finish the Archons and make our way to the hacking station. We took quite a bit of damage, but everyone survived. And I'm not using any of these soldiers on the final mission, so the injuries are really no big deal. And then just like that, the A-Team is ready to go. And these people, thankfully, are all at kernel level. I'm actually expecting this mission to be a lot easier than the one we just did. But of course, if this run has taught me anything at all, it's to always expect the unexpected. And just to put things into perspective, why I'm not too worried about this mission, we have a Shredstorm cannon, a blaster bomb, and I believe 16 grenades, 1-6. So hopefully we'll have enough supplies to make it through the whole mission. And of course, the usual rule applies, we can't use the commander's avatar for combat purposes. So first is the typical Archon and two Mutons. We overwatch the Archon into the next dimension, and the Mutons just stand there, they don't scatter. And I have been told what causes this to happen is taking out the pod leader when you reveal the pod. The underlings then don't scatter for some reason. Again, the more you know, and this may be something I'm able to exploit in the future. And I'm certainly not complaining about it. It makes them a lot easier to demolish. Next is the sector pod, and to be honest, between shredding, blue screen rounds, and chain shot, we absolutely obliterate it. And the underlings are both shield bearers, so I'm not really worried about them. They'll most likely just pop their shield even if they do survive, which they don't. Then it's a squad of four vipers, but one panics right away at the sight of the Viper King armor. And vipers are well and truly a one-shot at this point, so we put them down quite rapidly. And I do have to say here, it's really nice to be making difficult shots rather than missing absurdly easy shots. But the next pod is truly something disgusting. Three Berserkers and three Faceless. Now Faceless are a guaranteed one shot, that's how powerful our cannons have become, so Hoffman goes to town on them with Death From Above, and between Rapid Fire, Chain Shot, Serial, and Death From Above, we actually wipe out the whole pod. That's 102 HP we just took down in one turn. So our Grenadiers have well and truly found their stride. And now the final pod, I think. Two Gatekeepers and some Codexes. 
And the worst part is I haven't been able to get everyone onto the roof before the pod activates. We're out of position here. So the plan is to take out the gatekeepers and distract the codexes with our mimic beacon. And the plan seems to be going very well. The gatekeepers are history, so now we just have to throw the mimic beacon. So we've activated four mutons with our last soldier. This could get a little bit rough. So Cat takes a shot from a muton, but that seems to be the worst of it, which is actually really good. I was expecting much worse. The Codex hits us with a psionic bomb and drops dead from doing so. Not entirely sure what happened here. I think because we had the ability that causes psionic attacks to damage the caster, that the Cybomb counted as an individual psionic attack for every soldier it hit. So that Codex just took a massive amount of feedback damage. But then things take a turn for the worse. Another pod of all Stun Lancers activates. So I think we've got nine enemies active now. So much for the Gatekeepers being the last pod. But it's not over yet. We start with a grenade on three Mutons, this allows them to be a one-shot with Hoffman, who exploits death from above. Three more grenades take out three stun lances. I'm not happy to be burning through so many supplies, but we can't move and shoot due to the Cybomb, so grenades are our best bet here. I'm hoping Hoffman can one-shot this Muton, but the damage roll falls short. I use a flashbang with Chan, but because she has Volatile Mix, even her flashbangs do a little bit of damage, and this is enough to finish the Muton. That's really nice. And I had actually forgotten she had that ability, otherwise I would have used the flashbang first. But one Stun Lancer has survived and hits Pyrotechnic. It stuns him, but thankfully it hasn't knocked him out. We would have no way of reviving him if it did. So we take out the Codex and Stun Lancer, and we heal Pyrotechnic. We are a little under-resourced now, having used more grenades than I would have liked, but we should still be okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll be fine. Definitely. Maybe. Hopefully. So we activate the Avatar, and it takes a few shots, but we take it down without too much hassle. We also take down one of the Archons and freeze the remaining one. Quite a good turn to open the final chamber. Now we get a pot of Vipers on both sides of the map. The ones on the left aren't a problem, as Hoffman should be able to wipe the whole pot out single-handedly. But on the right side, our soldiers just aren't in a good position to get to these snacks. Now two grenades may seem like a bit of overkill, but it gets the job done. And back on the left, Failed and Drifter help with the snake hunting. We should share the love, you know? Now the second avatar is surrounded by mutons and berserkers, which is obviously awful. The other reinforcements are thankfully only faceless, which we can deal with easily. And in fact, using Serial, Pyrotechnic takes them all down by himself. A chain shot on the second avatar does huge damage and sends it teleporting right in front of Pyrotechnic. Now avatar, that was not a wise decision on your part. But now here comes the advent counter attack. The berserkers both charge Hoffman, but thankfully they're too far away to be able to attack her. The surviving muton, however, inflicts massive damage on her with a critical hit. And we've got chrysalids coming in. We are starting to get overwhelmed here. Now thankfully our grappling hook is recharged by now, so we can propel Hoffman away from the berserkers. We then use a grenade plus salvo plus death from above combo to take down all the chrysalids with Hoffman. Drifter takes out the muton in one hit just to help out, very nice. Chan is able to one-shot one of the berserkers into the ground. Cat gives Drifter an extra action thanks to their bond, and he grenades the remaining Berserker. Hoffman does fire at it, but it does survive with 6 HP. And now the last Avatar arrives, while the Berserker stuns Drifter. But as long as we can beat the Avatar this turn, it won't matter. So Cat activates Chain Shot, and... Okay, 
The second shot is an execution, and the avatar is gone, just like that. So, there you have it. We've beaten War of the Chosen using only Grenadiers. And honestly, what can I even say about this run? It was just insane. Crazy RNG really made this more difficult than it needed to be, but hopefully that last mission demonstrates how powerful Grenadiers can be in the right circumstances. I mean, can you imagine if we had this level of RNG shenanigans in the Templar run? We would have failed the entire campaign. So this video may make this class look worse than it actually is, but we took the hits, we overcame the nonsense, we wouldn't have been able to do that with a lesser class. Grenadiers are pretty good. And there was actually other stuff that happened in this run that I didn't really mention, like we were really broke for huge chunks of the game, not able to get the resources that we needed, and at one point the game kept unequipping all our guns after each mission, and I had to give them back to all the soldiers manually have no idea what was causing it. It was just a really weird run from top to bottom, and it makes this kind of impossible to compare with the other classes. But anyway, speaking of the other classes, there's only one base class left. So yeah, we'll be running only sharpshooters next, and we'll see how we fare. Surely it can't be any more insane than this one. And I've got something a little different planned for the outro of this video. I hope you enjoy it. And shout out to viewer LostFan10000 for the idea. I hope you enjoyed this wacky run, and I do hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.